Good afternoon, happy Valentine's Day. We have afternoon court today in New Mexico for Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Her trial is getting ready to start next week for the shooting of the cinematographer on the set of Rust. Today, the one motion I wanna see argued is this motion to dismiss over the leaked text messages between the defense attorney and the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Uh, leaked by the prosecution, but also there was a FOIA request also to one of the witnesses. Like there's a lot going on today. So we are going to hop into court live. They're doing it on Google meet. There's going to be numerous motions argued today. Hopefully we'll get a sense of how long jury selection will take, but this is the last really big court hearing or should be the last big court hearing in this case before um, this goes to trial. And this this judge has been getting spicy with the attorneys. The attorneys have been getting spicy with each other. So I'm gonna roll the intro. Court's getting started, and we're gonna we're gonna go. Law nerds, happy Valentine's Day. Good to see you. Let's go. Hey there. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursy words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts not let's get into it all right you guys and i'll chime in as i can and put up um chats and stuff on the screen as i can i'll probably mess with my setup a little bit but let's just start court and i will answer questions sometimes in the chat and sometimes out loud but uh let's go to judge summer's court the matter i'm calling is d101 cr 202340 State of New Mexico versus Hannah Gutierrez. Party state their name. Carrie Morrissey and Jason Lewis on behalf of the state of New Mexico. Yeah, good afternoon. Jason Bowles and Todd Bullion. And Miss Gutierrez Reed is hey! on also. Okay. We've got a better camera angle for the defense. Thanks, counsel. It looks so much better. All right. So we have, I believe, three pending motions let's start with the uh, state's motion in limine to prohibit to prohibit use or testimony of oshb findings and report this is the osha findings and the osha report motions in limine are trying to reduce or limit what comes in at trial it's making some of those evidentiary decisions before this gets to trial so that's what the court's talking about i want to get to the motion to dismiss that's what I, that's what I'm uh, for. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> so the, the state filed a motion to preclude uh, the use of the OSHA report for, for the following reasons. What OSHA does is they enforce workplace safety. Uh, OSHA is never going to be in a position the where OSHA they- report, By the way, the OSHA report was fucking scathing. Like the OSHA report was like everything on this set is a mess. I could see why the defense might want to use it though to say everything on this set was a mess. It's not on just Hannah Gutierrez Reed because it's on all these other people too. So I can see why the state's like, no, no, we don't want to pass the buck on like some other dude did it. Um, uh, start finger pointing at certain employees. <laughs> what, I just uh, what they do is they say employer in this case, that being Rust Productions, uh, you weren't doing things right, right. And we believe that some of the things that you weren't doing right may have led to this death. OSHA is never going to issue a report that hey, says, Jesus. we find that Hannah Gutierrez is, is negligent for putting a live round in a gun. That's simply not what they do. All they do is go in and investigate employers and companies and agencies uh, to determine whether or not the employers have proper safety protocols set up. And they did not. Shock to allow Shocking. information from the OSHA report to be heard by a jury. First of all, it's going to be confusing uh, because the jury is going it's to. Not confusing. This this movie set was a shit show, and that's what OSHA said look at the OSHA report and say, well, OSHA didn't find that Hannah Gutierrez did anything wrong. But the truth is, is that that's not what OSHA does. OSHA was not investigating Hannah Gutierrez. 
OSHA was investigating Rust Productions because that's what they do. That's just their job. Um, it would be similar to, Your Honor, let's, let's imagine that, that if there's a domestic violence battery case uh, and um, that's not at all, ma'am, that's not at all the same as a workplace inc incident. And the defendant who's criminally charged with battery comes into court and says, hey, I had a restraining order hearing about this incident and the judge found that I did not commit an act of abuse. So I should get to share that with the jury. Of course, we would never let that happen because what's happening in the restraining order hearing is completely different. The standard is completely different. The evidence is completely different. Everything is completely different. We would never allow that in a criminal trial. And this is absolutely no different. Uh, one of the, as the court can see, and I understand that we're not hearing this motion today, a motion in limine was filed by the state because we're going to need the court to help us uh, try to figure out. Aren't we arguing the motion right now? Aren't we arguing the motion right now? Isn't that like literally what we're doing though? How to, how to rein in uh, some of the defendants experts. And, and I can tell you judge, <laughs> I, I mean, in order for okay. experts, I, I certainly, I read the defense's response where basically what they're doing is they're saying, we're not going to give the report to the jury, but we're going to have our experts say we read the report and we relied on the report ah. in coming up with our expert opinion. Well, what you have to understand is, for example, one of their experts is just a movie director. All he does is direct movies. And the only thing that he's reviewed related to the evidence in this case is the OSHA report. So a man who has presumably not reviewed the statements of Ms. Gutierrez, has not reviewed the statements of any of the other participants or witnesses in the case, hasn't reviewed any of the photos, hasn't read any of the police reports, hasn't done any of that stuff, is going to come in and give an opinion because uh, he read the, the OSHA report. And that's not how expert testimony works. Uh, there has to be something about what the expert is relying on. And this is why the motion to eliminate to try to limit this for testimony. for them to rely on it so that it can uh, influence their this opinion. This is the DA. An OSHA report isn't something that, that these experts can rely on. Just so we're oriented, Carrie Morrissey is the special prosecutor. The prosecutor is arguing that the defense experts can't come in and use the OSHA report and be like, see, OSHA said it was production's fault, not Hannah Gutierrez Reed's fault. That's what she's arguing at length at the moment. This isn't a case about whether or not there was workplace safety. If, if Russ Productions I mean, was on criminal trial for wasn't. workplace safety, uh, would the OSHA report be admissible? Yeah, it, it might be under that set of circumstances. Workplace safety, but we can't have problem. defense experts who are movie directors come in and say, "I'm here to testify that the derision." Who are movie directors? <laughs> the problem is this: who's responsible in this scenario is a very complicated question and they're going to have to prove industry standards as well so you have to deal with the movie industry to deal with this case because the context is is unique and very specific um yeah so yeah anna gutierrez didn't do anything wrong because i'm a movie director and i read an osha report I mean, that, that can't happen. That, 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 that's, that's not that, that enough. That is so far afield I agree that from, that's from not enough. anything that, that is reliable in terms of expert opinions. So I'm asking the court to, to treat this the way that we would treat anything that's happening sort of in a, in a quasi-administrative hearing that's remotely related to a criminal case. It doesn't come in. It's confusing. The issues are different. Thank you. Mr. Bowles, response. Yes, Your Honor. First of all, with regard responding. to the experts, uh, Ms. Morrissey went into another motion, which is not addressing the OSHA motion, and that's a Daubert motion. I want to talk about that later, that this is Ooh, a let's talk about completely the late later. filed, disguised Daubert motion. 
um, which they know about since November when those interviews happen. Um, with okay. regard to the OSHA specifically, okay. Ms. Morrissey said at the beginning of her argument to this court that OSHA... Defense has a hundred percent stepped up their Google Meet game. Like if we're going, if we're going to be taking a look at the holistic scenario, this is a better setup, better audio, better video, T 10 out of 10. Thank you, defense. She does not look at employee conduct. Actually, she interviewed Mr. Genoway, who's a supervisor at OSHA. Uh, and this was, um, back several months ago, she asked him that question that you're not focusing in the armor. Mr. Genoway said, well, this OSHA statute does include provision that requires employees comply with OSHA standards and requirements. Yes, ultimately. It would seem that at a minimum, OSHA requires you not put loaded, you not put live ammunition into a weapon, hand it to an actor, have him point it and shoot it at somebody. It seems like, it seems like that is at least a minimal issue. They are looking at the employer. However, there is a provision that requires employees also comply with OSHA. Now in their findings, Judge, which were comprehensive, they went through the various safety failures of various parties. Now, Mr. Genoway later says he finds that Ms. Gutierrez had uh, issues in response to Ms. Morrissey's question, as did others. So these findings all are the context is by which the jury should be allowed to uh, to review the prosecution's theories, which are solely Hannah Gutierrez Reed caused the safety failures on this set, and they want to blame her, but then they don't want the jury to have the context. Which seems like a losing strategy to me. You guys might disagree, but just blaming Hannah Gutierrez Reed when so many people failed, a jury's going to sit there and be like, but what about the other failures? It doesn't mean that 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 Hannah Gutierrez Reed didn't fail catastrophically in in her job, but it doesn't mean that other people didn't fail as well. Multiple people can fail for this to have happened. And in fact, I would argue multiple people had to have failed for this to happen. Text that another state agency, a federal uh, OSHA, had reviewed this and they found safety failures across the board. Now, Judge. It would distort the truth. It would keep the truth from the jury, and it would prevent. It would present a uh, lack of context of the whole set because we have a set here where many people had things that they did that led to a tragic accident. It was not Miss Gutierrez Reed who solely caused something, and that's what the prosecution is trying to say. So they don't want us to be able to put in any defenses with regard to a state agency who found that there were multiple safety failures across the board by management. Now that's highly relevant and it's very important to Ms. Gutierrez Reed's case because the prosecution is gonna to try to blame her solely for the whole thing. So it's important that we get to counter that with the appropriate with context. The, but other people Experts also are failed. entitled to rely on hearsay. Now we're not asking to- That's true. To, uh, introduce the report. As this court knows, police reports are not introduced because they're hearsay within hearsay. OSHA reports unless there's also some kind of introduced. exception that comes up. We're not asking to introduce the report itself, but certain of the findings certainly um, can they be used by an expert under the expert rules in terms of their opinions. We're not going to ask um, to introduce that report, however. But Judge, the premise Ms. Morrissey told you at the very start is is wrong. Mr. Genoway said employees are also governed by some of the provisions of OSHA. Now, ultimately, their findings were against the employer, but they reviewed the entirety of safety conduct, conduct on that set, and the jury's entitled to hear that. It would, it would really, um, it would be a complete gutting in some ways of the defense if this court ruled out our ability to put in the context to the jury which is what the prosecution wants. They don't want any defense, but that is I a mean, big part of our defense. They, um, you're allowed to have a defense. Other people caused issues. And, and multiple this is part witnesses, of it Judge, not, of 49 interviewed in this case, multiple witnesses talk about safety failures and rushing and production issues and that, things like that. We need to be able to put that into context. Your Honor, if I may do a, a, a brief reply. So, Mr. So Bowles didn't continues you. to say in his pleadings, and now during this hearing, 
that the state is singling Ms. Gutierrez out and that we are holding her solely responsible for this incident. That is a lie. Mr. Bowles knows that what he is saying is a lie. Because they're also prosecuting uh, Mr. Baldwin. Halls was charged. Mr. Yeah, Halls yeah. entered a plea. Yeah. Hang on just case. a second. Mr. Halls Mr. was Mr. charged. Mr. Balls, Mr. Balls, um, you may do us a reply. Please let her finish. Yeah. Okay. She's speaking, sir. Mr. Halls was charged. Mr. Halls entered a plea. Mr. Baldwin has been indicted. The people who the state believes have criminal culpability for the death of Helena Hutchins have all been charged. So let's make that clear. Every time Mr. Bowles says that during a hearing or in a pleading, it is not true, and he knows that it is not true. Having said that, yes, of course, OSHA is- As this trial, they're pointing to Hannah Gutierrez Reed only because she's gonna be the only one on trial. So th this trial is gonna be spicy, y'all. Going to look at the conduct of employees in order to determine whether or not the employer had adequate safety protocols in place. And that's exactly what they did in this case. And, and, and look, the, this, is, this is the case of Hannah Gutierrez. Um, and, and there are certain people that Mr. Bowles under the law can point to and say, this person shares responsibility with her. Alec Baldwin is a perfect example. Mr. Bowles's defense is going to be Alec Baldwin pulled the trigger and he shouldn't have pulled the trigger. And that that causes True. issues with he proximate cause. Those are all. But he didn't put the he didn't put the bullet in the gun, but he absolutely shouldn't have pulled the trigger. True. True. Legitimate legal defenses. An OSHA report that 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 basically finds Rust Productions had some liability, but doesn't comment on the fact that there is evidence that Hannah Gutierrez brought the live rounds on set. There is evidence that Hannah Gutierrez did not find. I'm going to need to know a lot more about that, because remember, they did not charge the prop house. They, in fact, did a chemical analysis of the gunpowder at the prop house and the God, Emily, don't send gunpowder and lead. At the gunpowder at the prop house and the gunpowder in the bullet that killed Helena Hutchins and found that the live rounds that ended up on set could not have come from the prop house, which is why Seth Kinney and PDQ Arm and Prop was never charged because they did a whole uh, chemical analysis of the different gunpowder. So getting to the point that um, Hannah Gutierrez Reed is the one that brought them onto set is something we haven't heard a lot about, and I want to hear a whole lot more about that. And, and remove those live rounds for 12 days until Helena Hutchins was shot. None of that is in this OSHA report. So if we have experts take the witness stand. Okay, I'm going to back up. What are we talking about with 12 days? What, what do we do? Gutierrez did not find and remove those live rounds for 12 oh she brought them on sorry for the the dirty pause she brought them on, she's alleging the prosecutor's alleging that hannah gutierrez reed brought the live rounds on set and did not find them and did not um pull them out of rotation for 12 days on set how do they know that those were brought on set 12 days ahead there's so much information in this case we don't know yet days until helena hutchins was shot none of that is in this osha report so if we have experts take the witness stand and say, I'm a Hollywood director this, and I read an OSHA report this sounds like and a I'm here to tell though. you that Ms. Gutierrez didn't do anything wrong. We are so far afield. You're just going to laugh. Of, You're just going to uh, like, of what Lol. expert testimony is supposed to be. Expert testimony is supposed to be reliable. What the expert relies on has to be relevant. If the court eliminates the OSHA findings from the trial, what the court will be doing is just simply leaving the jury with the relevant information and the relevant evidence. This is not relevant evidence. This is a smoke screen that Mr. Bowles wants to use to convince a jury that Hannah Gutierrez has absolutely no culpability when OSHA was simply not tasked with the answering that question. Because that's not their Thank job. Thank you.
I mean, because that's not their job. Judge, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Judge, actually, that is not correct. The relevant information is the context of the OSHA report. Now, if Ms. Morrissey's case was just individual, discrete instances, for example, loading the firearm, uh, for example, how did the lab rounds get on set, which we have plenty of evidence it was somebody else that put those lab rounds on set. Excuse me? Excuse what evidence it's what evidence that someone else put those rounds on set? I I this is going to be a very interesting trial. But if they were just discrete instances, then then her argument would make more sense. But what they want to put on a trial, and the court will see, is a series of they're gonna show this whole set was was negligent in their opinion. And they've written this in pleadings. There's negligence I all mean, over the set. Well, the problem is then the jury doesn't hear the context of the findings uh, by the the production and everybody else that caused these safety failures. So we have interviewed Lorenzo Montoya, the investigator, and Bob Genoway, the supervisor. Those people are, are, we're not talking about, they're not experts. They're the actual people who did the investigation. Now, we're not going to ask a Hollywood director to say because of OSHA, um, there was nothing wrong. Ms. Gutierrez Reed did nothing. We're not we're not going to do that, but that's a separate motion. That's an expert. What director she can is attack testifying the expert at trial? Later. Uh, and, and the I last thing know. I'm going to say, I... I I um the, the personal attacks I, I do take objection to, and I'm going to put that on the record because it's been in the pleadings and it continues by Miss Morrison. What personal attack? She's mad that you're characterizing it. Thank as you. If the court makes the following ruling people. with respect to the state's motion in limine. To I love that this judge is just like, "Yup, ruling go." Prohibit to prohibit use of testimony of OSHB findings and report. The court denies the state's motion in limine. First, the court finds and concludes that pursuant to 11401 NMRA, the OSHB findings and report constitute relevant evidence because it has a tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without the evidence. And the fact is of consequence in determining the action. For instance, the findings and report may impact- What she's saying is that the OSHA report can come in through the expert testimony of the defense, and then the prosecutor can cross-examine that expert just like she just did. So you think it's okay, sir, expert Hollywood director, for an armorer in charge of safety to put a loaded bullet on a gun on a set? You think that's fine? That's cool? Like, no? Okay, good. We're clear. That's it. At the state's theory of causation. Second, pursuant to rule 11-403, the court finds and concludes that the probative value of the OSHB findings and report is not substantially outweighed by a danger of unfair prejudice, confusing the issues or misleading the jury. Right. Rather, the state can address any perceived limitations of the report and via cross-examination cross of the witness by sense. whom the report is addressed. Defense, prepare that motion. I think that makes sense. Yes, sure. All right. So We're going to move on to the motion to sever. So the defense won there. The defense won. The prosecution lost. The prosecution brought the motion to keep out the OSHA report. And the judge is like, yeah, no. The experts can testify about it. They can rely on it. That's it. Charges and exclude mention of alleged other bad acts. All right. Motion to sever. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Judge. I'll be arguing that on behalf of Ms. Gutierrez Reed. Uh, we are. Your tech setup is not as good, Todd. Sorry, man. It's it's not as good. The movement. It's my understanding the state, uh, notwithstanding us being the movement, actually carries the burden here to show a fact and consequence. I can go first, or or the state can go first. Typically, the state would go first because they're the they bear the burden. Ms. Morrissey, this is not my motion. I, I don't see why I you should wish, have to. Do go you wish to go first? <laughs> Why the fuck do I have to? You're honored. I I didn't bring this motion. I don't care. I don't care. I don't want to go first. This prosecutor is so spicy. This trial is going to be magic. No. All right. Thank you. <laughs> do you want to go first? Nope. Negative, okay. Ghost Rider. Go, bro. Judge. It's your motion, uh, dude. We filed our initial motion uh, to sever this tampering charge and we 
challenged the state to come forth with some theory of admissibility. In their response, they spell out uh, how they believe these acts are connected. And those arguments are based solely and completely on speculation. Okay. Um, his, his, his monotone delivery is, is hard for me. Um, yes, I said that pretrial motions can be spicy. There's no jury. So you get to see a different side of the attorneys when they are arguing in front of the judge versus um, their behavior in front of a jury. So it's interesting to see their demeanor here and how that demeanor may or may not change when they get in front of a jury. But um, it's it's just it's a it's a funny gambit on in this particular trial. So spicy, spicy. Uh, for instance, in the state's motion, uh, in the state's response, they indicate that Hannah was nervous in the presence of police officers, and they attribute I mean, that to a lot uh, of potential a lot of people might cocaine be. use. That's not supported by by anything. Uh, I think that's kind of a stretch unless they drug tested her and found she was actually under the influence of cocaine at the time. Um, uh, and they identify a plausible alternative explanation as they're discussing it, saying that she could be under the excitement or stress of the event. There's case law that we cited in our reply that says that when there are multiple plausible explanations for something, that's not probative evidence. That's speculation that runs afoul of the jury instruction uh, to only decide a case based on its facts instead of making speculation guess. In essence, what the state is seeking to do is they want the jury to assume that at some point in time, prior to going to work on October 21st, 2021, that Ms. Gutierrez Reed ingested cocaine. They have no evidence as to well they can't suggest uh, that if they don't have any evidence to back it up they have no evidence as to when that would have happened they have no evidence as to how much uh cocaine it's giving real housewives that that scene where lisa run is just like out of nowhere like were people doing coke in your bathroom like they're they're literally arguing that the state's like so were you on coke like is that is that what was happening this day <laughs> okay would have been consumed can I speak or how it would affect sir Miss Gutierrez Reed's body oh that's or her mental perception and acuity you're speaking you're speaking Those are below the acceptable speed for my ADHD all very critical assumptions that the government wants to take as a first step following that this they want better. to speculate further that this assumed drug use would be affecting Miss Gutierrez Reed while she's at work they have no expert testimony to support this, but more, really more importantly, they have no facts. Uh, there's a case yeah. that we cited, State versus Downey. The prosecution can't just be like, maybe they were on coke. Like that's not ever acceptable. There has to be like evidentiary support for the shit that you say. So you cannot just rampantly speculate at all. It, 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 no, you can't. So I don't know why this motion is coming up because this should never come up because this is this is this shouldn't be a thing. Which discussed the use of retrograde extrapolation. The ar argument that the state seeks to make here is very similar to Downey, but there's some differences. Uh, in Downey, they actually had a data point to work backwards from. Uh, the gentleman in that case had actually been arrested and his blood was tested, and the expert attempted to work backwards. Now, the New Mexico Supreme Court, identifying that there was no information as to when this gentleman had first consumed alcohol, no information as to how it was being metabolized in his body, uh, they threw that opinion out, saying that it was mere guesswork. That is exactly what the state is seeking to do here. Furthermore, Judge, I agree, Lyndon. the basic premise that uh, they want the jury to assume that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was using drugs is based on a propensity argument. This is expressly prohibited in 404. That's the to whole do point coke? of the rule, is to not argue that someone has a character trait, therefore they must have acted in conformity with a character trait. Their response makes this very clear that that's what they're doing. They describe Ms. Gutierrez-Reed as, and I quote, a person who uses drugs, person who abuses substances. They are 
attempting with their evidence to show that she has this character trait, and then they want to argue that she acted in conformity with it. That, that's a propensity evidence, a propensity argument, clear and simple. The rules ban that. They cannot do that. Yeah, they can't do that. Uh, <clears throat> in the uh, state's response through pages four to six, they include several text messages, and they argue that those provide uh, their factual foundation here. None of those messages, none of them, not a single one, indicates or suggests that Ms. Gutierrez Reed had used cocaine on any point in time on the day of incident or the day before the day of incident. At best, at best for the government, there is a tax state that suggests that Ms. Gutierrez Reed may have used marijuana. They make reference to, I just smoked, and then the state puts in parentheses referring to marijuana. The government in its argument but do they have marijuana evidence? use is not, is not relevant here. Do, in they connecting... have re do they have evidence other than her saying, I just smoked to what she was referring to? I have questions. This tampering with evidence, which the government claims is cocaine, and the involuntary manslaughter. There, there's no connection at all with, with marijuana use. Uh, <clears throat> further, Judge, uh, the state in its argument includes several photos of ammunition and claims that they are easily vis visually distinguished between live and dummy rounds. The state- Also, just for what it's worth, I generally don't give a fuck what drugs people do. I'm not, uh, I don't get super fussed about it. I get a little frustrated when you're the one in charge of weapons. If you're using drugs at work, I feel like there's evidence that that could impair, you know, cognition. So I, I feel like if they have evidence of drug use, that's going to be relevant because the question everybody wants to know is how the fuck, how the fuck did a live bullet end up in a gun? How did we miss this? And so if there's evidence that she's using substances that could absolutely impair uh, her cognitive ability, then it becomes more relevant. Expert, uh, Mr. Carpenter, two years ago on News Nation stated that it is very I difficult I'm just telling to distinguish live ammunition from dummy rounds. And that is in fact the point of dummy ammunition, that it looks real. Uh, so that way when you're doing a close-up shot of an actor loading a gun or ammunition in a gun belt that it looks real. So the, the argument that the state is trying to make that Ms. Gutierrez Reed was impaired to the point that she couldn't visually distinguish live rounds from dummy rounds. And if that's just, the case, that's it, a problem. It, it just doesn't work. Dummy rounds are supposed to look like live rounds. Uh, <clears throat> but she's the expert who's supposed to be able to tell the difference. See, that's her, that's her, that's her job. And judge, this argument would be extremely prejudicial uh, to Ms. Reed it, it, if the yes, jury were to believe be. that she is someone who uh, the government wants them to believe goes to work while she's intoxicated. Yeah, that could be uh, a problem. That has extreme, extreme prejudice. And there's no probative value because they have no foundation for that. There's probative value if there's Furthermore, evidence Judge, that... the state did not address in their response Thank the argument the specifically about opinion. the rule on joinder, 5203. 5203A1 states that you have to have acts that are similar in nature Thank you, to join. Uh, the two crimes here Thank you, Olivia. that Ms. Gutierrez is charged with, tampering and voluntary manslaughter, they're very different from one another. They're not similar acts. Oh, they are. They're also asking to sever out the um, evidence tampering because I believe she had narcotics on her or was trying to figure out how to not have narcotics on her when she went to go interview at the police station. Um, and they want to sever out that evidence from the rest of the trial. Interesting argument. I don't think that's going to fly. And 5203A2 uh, says to join, you must have acts that are linked uh, together as a series of acts. Here we don't have that either because there's no evidence actually linking uh, the alleged tampering with the alleged involuntary manslaughter. So we would ask judge for those reasons for the defendant's motion to be granted and for that count to be severed and also uh, that the state be prohibited during the involuntary manslaughter trial from bringing any of that up. Anything about substance abuse, 
anything about drug the use. The defense is um, doing their job. They definitely, this is a good argument. Tampering. Thank you. For them. Ms. Morrissey. Your Honor, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a little confused just in terms of the procedure and the, the motions that we're hearing today. Um, the court gave Why didn't we bring this up at the, ma'am? Why didn't we bring this up at the beginning? Gave the state a deadline of February 2nd to file a 404B notice. We did that. We filed it on February 2nd. The defense has never filed a motion to exclude the specific things that are in that 404B notice. So I'm not sure exactly where we are on actually <laughs> addressing the 404B issues that the state Your wants Honor, to get into. I can't do my job if they don't do theirs. What the defense is not allowed to do is to look at our 404B notice and then just kind of incorporate into their reply uh, their motion to exclude because by doing so... No, they can't bring up new subject matter in their reply. Yeah, can't do that. It, it doesn't provide us with the opportunity to file a response. So I would ask the court to give us some clarification in terms of how we need to address all of these 404B issues. Having said that, I can move into the motion to sever. So let me address your concern. Sure. So in your response, you identified not just a conversation about the cocaine after the death. You went through all these text messages that you intended to introduce. And you intended, you, you said that these all showed that she was working impaired. So it does go to the severance motion. It's basically in the severance motion, but you also noticed it in the prior, uh, in, in the uh, prior bad acts. But we have to address it in the severance motion because that's you're maintaining that her being under the influence offset because all these texts are offset. Offset is a series of acts connected to the manslaughter. And so you also state in your response. The judge is like, let me tell you a the couple of things. Number one, let and I think this goes to said. Mr. Bullion's um, response, this is what you said. that the jury's going to be able to conclude all this. This is not, you have no expert witness, to my knowledge, that's going to say, if you do alcohol, marijuana, and, and cocaine, uh, and I don't know when, when this expert's going to be able to know, other than the marijuana the night before, um, and not knowing any of the amounts, that she worked impaired on, Octo on October 21st. So you also say that you have many people, you have extensive texts, which I think are, we have the extent of them. And then you also say you have many eyewitnesses to her using drugs on the set. When though? Rust. When was she using drugs on the set? And the big question for the court, and what I would like you to address, is the nexus between your allegations of her drug use and her impairment on October 21. Because at this point, I agree with Mr. Bullion. It's completely speculative. So until you can, I'm hopeful that your statement um, is is what is the nexus for you, because that's you're going to have to identify what the nexus is. How are these two things connected? So, Your Honor, what one of the the, the primary issues in this case is that the the negligent act is not limited to October 21st there were a series of negligent acts that we have very concrete evidence of uh, that, that Ms. Gutierrez um, was engaging in these negligent acts as she moves through the filming of the movie during- I don't know if her smoking weed on her off time is going to count as an ongoing negligent act. Like I'm not, unless, unless that is close in time to when she's loading this weapon, we're going to have some problems of those days. So during the days that you're seeing the text messages between her and Mr. Trujillo about using cocaine, she's showing up to work the next day and she is failing to remove those live rounds that are already on set that we can see in photos. And if you want me to show the photos where we can actually see them on the set, one of them we can see in her hand, one of them, on how the can you tell how do you know that that's a live round in her hand and you're alleging that she didn't know i've got questions of october is in her hand for let heaven's sake let me just interrupt you for, because it's it, not to me that it's in her hand how are you connecting her use of these uh, the uh, judge is like ma'am name them 
Name them. How can you prove that she was impaired at the time she was loading the gun? Name them. And I don't think the DA can, and that's why she's arguing about something else. Because I don't think Hannah Gutierrez Reed was drug tested when she was interviewed by law enforcement the day this all went down. Of uh, marijuana. Hope was one time in these text messages. Do you have anything more than these text messages? I guess is what I'm asking. And so other I, than, I apologize. What do you have? And other that than the, the intoxication text? of being blackout drunk, and that her admission to police officers that she drank alcohol and smoked marijuana on evenings, which which I don't know if it's a paraphrase and I'd have to see that. But I'm, I'm, I'm not persuaded that this use as evidence in the text messages is enough to connect to, for you to connect her to the impairment. And the fact that you're saying that she was putting live rounds in begs the question. So we have a witness who is going to say that Ms. Gutierrez kept ammunition in her hotel room and at the same time would become impaired by marijuana. And? So obviously the nexus there is we have a person who is in possession of ammunition to be used on this movie set and she's high on marijuana. So that, Your Honor, I think absolutely has to come in. So they're speculating that she's like mixing the rounds at her hotel? Um, there's no question about that. She's in possession of the ammunition and she's high on marijuana and she brings the ammunition to the set. So we, but we have she, that. But is she high on marijuana when she brings the ammunition to the set? And how do you prove that other than to speculate? It, and look, let, me interrupt, let, me, let me interrupt you. <laughs> because the, these have to be specific. I'm going to make a ruling today. Being high on marijuana, that was on... Ma'am, you're gonna have October to you're gonna have to dial it in a 20th. bit more. Is that right? No, Your Honor, that's not the one I'm talking about. Which one um, is it? But we we have a well, witness. Sorry. I, okay, so you have a witness that says off hours, she had ammo in her room. Number one, I don't know what that means. Was it on a shelf? Was it what, was she playing with it? I don't know what that means. So I don't know how how probative that is, rather than preju prejudicial. So if that's the series of acts that. She was smoking high on marijuana. You have a witness to say hi, and that and that she was um, she had ammo in her room, and you want to make the nexus that that shows that this cocaine in her in her pocket or hotel is a, that all these are a series of acts that show involuntary manslaughter. I'm having a hard time to be honest. No, the the and I apologize, Your Honor. I I think you're We're all having a hard me. time. No, 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 ma'am, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. We're all on the same page with the judge. It's relevant that she's high on marijuana and has the ammunition in her room because we can demonstrate that she was impaired while in possession of How? ammunition, ammunition that was brought onto this movie set. That's it, full stop in, in terms of that testimony. That doesn't have anything to do with cocaine use. Um, we have a witness, and look, tampering is always joined with its well, companion oh, offense. Did you notice she switched arguments? Just completely switched arguments, ma'am? You did not make your argument yet. You're going to lose this motion. You're not done. And and now she's like tangented off to something else. Don't don't shift gears. Don't shift gears. Don't shift gears. Uh, the like like for example, we we frequently see a tampering charge be, because somebody disposes of a gun. Does the state have to prove that it was a real gun and, and that it was the exact gun that was used in the killing? Of course not. The defendant disposed of the gun and we have you're evidence to it so it comes in miss gutierrez was under investigation on october 21st because somebody on the movie set died and when she got back to her hotel room she took what our witness is going to say she was able to identify as cocaine and handed it to her how did your witness identify it did she sniff it sorry i have questions i have questions was she just like <laughs> definitely coke i have questions and then she spent four weeks trying to get it back over text message. That's just tampering. Tamper four weeks trying to get back the Coke? Did she give the Coke to the friend and was like, you need to hold this, they're gonna search my hotel room? I imagine that's what happened. It doesn't get severed from its companion offense. But you didn't answer Because the first it goes question. directly to consciousness of guilt. I think I have a fever. Why are you handing off a bag of your cocaine to someone who you hardly know after you've gotten back from the police station? It's consciousness of guilt. So in terms of the severance, 
the severance doesn't work at all. We, we you didn't never answer. severed tampering. From you didn't answer the other question, though. From the companion offense, for the exact reason that I just articulated, if the mm. if, if the court concludes that all of these text messages about her cocaine and marijuana yeah, marijuana use in the evening in. don't come in, we certainly can accept that. But the fact that she handed off You're what not, another person like is it. going to say she was able to identify as cocaine is... By the way, a lay person coming in to be like, that's definitely coke is uh, difficult. It, it, we'll see. Absolutely relevant. It is tampering with evidence. And it was handed off, not because she's trying to be friendly. She's trying to get rid of it so that the cops don't find it. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and all of that illegal. circumstantial evidence is right there. So if, if the court doesn't want the, the text messages about the cocaine to come in, I think that's perfectly reasonable. But at the same time, if Ms. Gutierrez takes the witness stand and says, I didn't use cocaine or I don't well, use cocaine. Well, that's a different question, though. I think we're dealing with a different story. Well, obviously. Obviously, yes, obviously you're dealing with a different story if she testifies, but you still didn't answer the question. I need you to circle back and answer the question. About is the, I understand about the tampering with evidence, but they're asking for a severance. Yes. And they're asking for a severance because severance, because what needs to be joined is the, based on the same conduct or on a series of acts, either connected together. Okay. So we're looking for a series of acts connected together. That can be consciousness of guilt, but do you have a series of acts connected together other than the tampering of evidence, uh, other than the the, um, the the getting rid of the cocaine? I know the answer, no. She brought live rounds onto a movie set. She failed to discover them for 12 days. She loaded one of them into a gun. It was then manipulated by an actor and very foreseeably someone died. She was taken to the police station to give a statement. After she got back from giving her statement, she took what appeared, and, and, and our witness would testify, was a bag of cocaine, handed it to her, and said, hang on to this for me, because she was under police investigation. It's the exact same connection you would see with any tampering charge. Right, I'm under you. police investigation. I'm handing my gun off. The right. court does not see how the, I don't want to get popped for possession of cocaine and the involuntary manslaughter go together because the in the removing the cocaine and this seems to be what the judge is thinking the removing the cocaine seems to be more of i don't want charges for being in possession of illegal narcotics more than i'm trying to cover up evidence of the uh negligent homicide here it seems and the court's saying these two things are different not wanting to get in trouble for possession of cocaine is different than trying to cover up and tamper with evidence of a negligent homicide that she hasn't been charged with yet. Reply. Judge, this is uh, very different than someone trying to conceal a murder weapon. If someone murders someone intentionally and they conceal the murder weapon, there's an obvious relevance nexus. to the weapon. There's a nexus. The, the weapon is obviously evidence in the murder. Here, the state has not provided any- That's what I just said. Any argument that this supposed cocaine goes together which they're saying was tampered with is relevant to the involuntary manslaughter they have tried to do that by making this impairment argument which they cannot make they don't have the necessary facts they don't have the necessary foundation they don't have the necessary experts it's all based on speculation and a propensity argument absent uh, some competent and admissible evidence that miss gutierrez reed was in fact uh, impaired by cocaine on the date of incident and they have no evidence there is no that. relevance whatsoever to her possessing cocaine or any other drug uh they're simply it's markedly different than someone concealing a murder weapon they haven't established that. the relevance uh, of this supposed cocaine they've tried and they've failed it, it has Honor, nothing so, ma'am you need to let him speak he let you speak sort of also supposed cocaine good band name wait no don't interrupt him please okay all right, the court is falling ruling. The court's done with all of you. This is getting denied. Or, or you're not finished, Mr. Bouillon? No, uh, no, 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 sir. Okay, new lawyers. When the court is, is asking questions of the other party and it looks like it's not going their way and the court cuts you off to make a ruling, that's when you stop because that's going in your favor. That's, that's, 
that's going in your favor. Just just stop. No, sorry, right. I'm, I'm good. Good. Yeah, just be done. Yep, smart. Okay. Be done. Thank you. All right. Much. All right. Yep, so I think I think I'm satisfied with what Ms. Morrissey was saying. The concern for me, Ms. Morrissey, was these what Mr. Bullion is describing as propensity is these time periods of that you had quoted in there. Um, so I'm going to make the following ruling and then I'm going to identify uh, a couple of things. So rule 5203A, it does talk about, um, and this is what I was looking at, are based on the same conduct or on a series of acts connected together. So basically what Ms. Morrissey is talking about with tampering of evidence is the same conduct or series of acts that she's talking about with um, the involuntary manslaughter charge. And so they, they, these series of acts are related to these charges. The state has a sufficient proffer. Okay, that the, I didn't think that was going um, that way at all. The following um, with respect to what she's planning on um, bringing in um, uh, surpasses the, the, uh, the, the argument for severance. So I do think that the text message, messages that you showed from 922, 1016, 1017, 1018, 1020, and 1021, the relevant ones are the one where she's smoking weed with the ammo in the hotel room and that she's smoking in the jacuzzi. Sorry, it just sounds like a game of Clue. I, I don't mean to laugh, but it sounds like a game of Clue where she's smoking weed with the ammo in the jacuzzi. I can't. I think those are the relevant uh, Text messages. Ones of the other of, of the acts that you in your response said you were going to show, plus the test text messages with respect to um after the fact with I can't remember that lady's name where she handed off the cocaine. But other than that, I do agree that the re the remainder of your intended text messages, as well Very as much. that intoxication the weekend before, are are not uh that they're they're, they're propensity evidence versus versus um probative evidence, and they would be unfair to the defendant. Understood. So the motion to sever is denied. Please prepare that um, order, Ms. Morrissey. Yes, Your Honor. So the defense, the prosecution lost their first motion. The defense lost their first motion. Let's see what happens next. All right, let's go to the uh, motion to sever charges and exclude mention of alleged, oh, sorry. Let's go to the motion for dismissal. Yes, yes, leaked text message motion. This is the one I want or in the alternative to suppress all disclosures and use of attorney-client communications and the recusal of the prosecutors. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, two hearings ago, Ms. Morrissey conceded to this court that this was not correct, it was not right, it and that have happened. the, it was the other search should be suppressed and everything flowing from that. She conceded that. She also stated in an email attached to our motion, in Exhibit D, uh, to our motion to dismiss, I believe very strongly in the attorney-client privilege and will consider anything you propose to suppress the communications. That is our Exhibit D, and that was July 25th, 2023. It was only after we filed our motion for the first time that Ms. Morrissey uh, chose to personally attack myself and Ms. Gutierrez-Reed and to raise a belated argument of waiver. And, and I wanna get to that in a little bit, but I wanna just stress how utterly egregious what has happened is. This court requested and this court took steps to review. Yes, we would like to also know how the fuck text messages between the defense attorney and the defendant got to the prosecutor and then got to a witness. We would also like to know. In camera, uh, a series of attorney-client privilege communications, which are cited in our motion at footnote three, in an 18,000 page document, there are numerous, numerous pages also of attorney-client communications texting. between myself and Ms. Gutierrez-Reed. Initially, in texting. December 8th, uh, of 2022, um, I'm sorry, 2021, I'm, the years, I, I'm going to make sure I get the dates right. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed's phone happened. was extracted by Sheriff Hancock, Detective Hancock. Prior to that extraction, we had communications by phone and by text. It was very clear, and Detective Hancock... Uh, may, may, I, may I interrupt you for a minute? Um, yeah. uh, Detective Hancock was here, but but because she's not a party, she was um, not, not allowed. Is she going to be called as a witness by somebody? Judge, I had subpoenaed her in case the court had questions, but I was going to make my argument, and then if the court, uh, we, she would be available. If All, so. right, thank you. All right, just so you know. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. And so in preparing a, a record of this, this court did get in-camera submission by the attorney for Seth Kenny uh, from these communications, and there was 18,000 pages 
and numerous, numerous pages of attorney-client communications yeah, that were extracted. Pages. Numerous, numerous the initial pages. extraction by Detective Hancock that Huge occurred on December 8th went to the RCFL. The RCFL then was given a filter, uh, which we now know from Byron French, with certain names. My name was not one of those. So Detective Hancock, in her first report, uh, knew, Why didn't you and as Ms. Morrissey admitted in an email, presumably she excluded the attorney-client. Well, she did. She did. So she knew in her professionalism, uh, in our communications, and our discussions, that those were not, I mean, they're, they're not fair game. They're not something we would agree to or ever waived or ever uh, said you can look at our communications. So Detective Hancock excluded those. The report came back was a thousand pages. Ms. Morrissey then gets on the case and approximately July 11th. Remember, this is the second special prosecutor. The other special prosecutor was recused. 2023. Ms. Morrissey, we have a hearing. Um, she gets another uh, report from RCFL, which goes to her expert in California. That expert in California then runs an 18,000 page report uh, from 1,000 pages to 18,000. How is the expert supposed to know what your name is, though, if that name isn't given to anybody? The very next day, on July 12, 2023, Ms. Morrissey, after she's talked to Seth Kenny, gives him the whole 18,000 pages without doing an attorney-client filter, without doing an IPRA review, which we've cited the I IPRA. thought that he FOIA'd it. I thought that Seth Kinney did a Freedom of Information Act request to get this. IPRA statute, which requires that attorney-client communications are not, they're excludable. They're not something you turn over um, in, the, in an IPRA request. Well, Ms. Morrissey didn't have an intake team. She didn't have an IPRA unit. She just unilaterally, as a special prosecutor, released all 18,000 pages of Seth Kenny. This was July 12, 2023. On July 25th, 2023, she then emails myself and Mr. Bullion and indicated, it has come to my attention that the second cell extraction contained text messages between you and your client. She then relates that she immediately told Mr. Kenny to uh, delete it. his copy. This is 12 days later. He's had them for 12 days or 13 days. 12 days, 12 days. She had the bullets for 12 days. They had the text messages for 12 days. But when a DA gets back a cell phone extraction, they might not review it immediately. Uh, and then it, she has reached out to Mr. Kenny, requested he delete him, and then said, I believe very strongly and will consider anything you propose to suppress. Then three days later, on July 28th, Ms. Morrissey said there was not a second extraction, uh, actually. The original extraction was December 8th. I then had a follow-up I sent to California. Okay, that's what I'm talking about with the July 12th. Well, Is then the entire 18,000 pages gets disclosed without any filter or any review or any steps taken by the government to ensure there's no attorney-client. Ms. Morrissey then later, when she finds that out, instructs her California expert to go through and do that filter and to exclude those attorney-client communications. So it was a very easy step that could have been done, but it was not done. So this... <sighs> There's a lot that goes into texting with clients because of this. But they don't do the upper review. And then the real egregious part of this, Your Honor, it, one, is that our attorney-client communications are invaded. But two, they have now turned these over to the chief uh, adverse witness to Ms. Gutierrez-Reed. The 18,000 pages, including Ms. Gutierrez-Reed communications with friends, her text with family members, her text with me, any text on that phone uh, that, that they extracted, which was a full extraction of her phone, went to Seth Kenny. So Seth Kinney is the individual who was the- Seth Kinney is the prop house master, the head of PDQ arm and prop. He was also supposed to be like a supervising armorer. She also sued him civilly. I covered that. Um, so he's the main witness against her being like, look, these, cause the jury's gonna ask, D you dude who supplied bullets, did these, are these bullets yours? And is that how they got on set? And he's like, no, these aren't mine. She must've brought them onto set. So this becomes a huge issue because he really is a main witness against Hannah Gutierrez Reed saying, I didn't bring these bullets on the set, but now he has all of her text messages. Chief ammunition supplier to the rest set and that we will have evidence at trial that most likely Mr. Kenny was the one who supplied the live rounds, which ended up on set. So now of course, the chief person, their defense, the, the their defense is going to be, she didn't bring the bullets on set. He brought the bullets on set. They were indistinguishable. That's what the defense is saying, Chad, that they are indistinguishable. The dummy rounds from the live rounds, that was his words, not mine, um, that they're indistinguishable. And it's the prop house that brought them onto set. And it's not Hannah Gutierrez Reed's fault. The other person that could have supplied those live rounds, he's got all of our communications. He's got all of Miss uh, Gutierrez Reed's personal and private communications. 
And so what we have seen here, Your Honor, is that the fact-finding process has been corrupted. Not only the idea of an attorney-client should never be invaded, it should never be some, uh, something that we worry about the government seeing, but I've never seen a prosecutor supply the chief adverse witness internal communications of the defendant, let alone the defendant and her attorney, because we want under the rule of exclusion, under Rule 615, for witnesses to testify to their own memory, uh, to testify to their own observations. That's the whole point of that rule. Well, now we have an individual who's going to be, who's supposed to be key to this trial, who has all of our communications and can't testify anymore from his soul, his memory and his own impressions, and he's tainted. So the further taint of that is Ms. Morrissey has had communications with them. Seth Kenny has had communications with the government from the get-go. He was in the sheriff's office day one, making calls to try to find out where the live rounds came from. He had many, many calls with the sheriff. Everybody detective. wanted to he know where the He has had many calls with Ms. Morrissey. From. This call that generated the alleged IPRA thing was July 11th. And all of a sudden, the next day, Seth Kenny's asking Ms. Morrissey for an IPRA um, the day after he talks to her about text. And then he gets all 18,000 texts. And now we have to go into a trial where the chief adverse witness has seen all of these. The problem, Your Honor, is that they took no steps, which would have been super easy. The cross-examination of Seth Kenny is going to be fire. To just filter them out, to just say, in a phone of this size, an extraction of this size, with a, a client who lives in another state, there's got to be some communication with her attorney. Now, Ms. Morrissey says that no attorney would ever communicate with her client over a phone. That, that, that happens. It happens when you're in court, when you're in, uh, you're not able to talk to the person, you can't return calls. The thing is a lot of prosecutors have two phones so that this doesn't happen, um, if, so their phones don't get extracted. But if the client's phone is getting extracted and you're talking about confidential communications, you have to let the attorney know, hey, I've been communicating with my client. Like, I don't know when the phone was extracted and how long after the incident they extracted the phone for. Eh. Eh. Uh, 16 hours a day to clients. Those communications happen. That's beside the point. Again, it's an attempt by the government to deflect to, what they did put and blame us. Right. Because you never expect as an attorney, it's never happened to be in 30 years, that the government's going to be uh, privy I mean, to your communications with your client. It's going to seize them and look at them and give them to a witness. Now, I'm not saying Ms. Morrissey and Mr. Lewis looked at them. They asserted not. they did not. I don't know that one way or another, but that's what the word they've given, that they did not look at them. But what they did say is they sent him to Seth Kenny, who had him for 12 days. Well, how'd they discover and, I, and I believe he looked at him. He had all of those communications for that time frame. So they didn't take any steps to shield those. Now, the two cases we've cited to the court, the Robinson case out of Delaware, there was a paralegal who obtained uh, communications from a defendant and his lawyer, a seized from his cell. She read those, uh, wasn't instructed not to read the attorney client. The Delaware court ends up dismissing, finding a Sixth Amendment violation of effective assistance of counsel because she was part of the team. In essence, Seth Kenny is the same situation. He's and been part of the government problem, team Michael. from the very first day of this case, trying to direct what they were looking at, what they were doing, and now their new theory that Ms. Gutierrez Reed brought live rounds on set. This is a new theory that Ms. Morrissey's had new the last couple when? of months. This was after the attorney client went to Seth Kenny that this theory comes up. The, the other case, Your Honor, is Schillinger versus Hayworth, and we cited from the Tenth Circuit. That case, uh, the court, the Tenth Circuit reverses for a new trial on an attorney client violation when. A uh, sheriff's deputy is present for court prep session with the defendant and his lawyer. He then tells the prosecutor about these prep sessions, and that comes out, so it's a violation. Well, the court there reversed and ordered a new trial. Ordinarily, uh, when we have a certain situation like this, Your Honor, the remedy is to suppress the witness who got the communications. Uh, if the prosecutors have had communication, to recuse those prosecutors. Um, now, here they say they never reviewed them, but we do know they've talked to Mr. Kenny. Um, and the problem, as we detail in our pleadings, is Seth Kenny has important information for both sides. Yeah, very so important information. He's not corrupted, but he has information. For example, right after the shooting, Sarah Zachary called him. She sent him a text emergency. She called him. They spoke for a couple of minutes, and then she threw rounds away. She got rid of rounds. And, and we've got to ask him. We've got to ask her about that. I've he's got, got questions about that. He's got important testimony for both sides, but he's now been tainted to the point on a fundamental fairness. How can a defendant have a fair trial when a chief adverse witness has all of the attorney-client text? And finally, Your Honor, I want to get I mean, to I don't know the if way it's all the attorney client texts. I would want to know the date of the extraction. I'm sure it's in the motions. I haven't gone over them. Um, I would want to know the date of the extraction to see how much they were talking strategy in this case. But as Runkle pointed out in the chat, and as was pointed out in the motions, they got permission from the defense to extract the phone. So the defense needed to say, however, we've communicated with our client. These are the attorney names in our firm. Those need to be filtered out idea and we've, we've gone through this on how inconsistent it is with with miss morrissey's uh communications right after after this happened it's also inconsistent with how sheriff hancock treated it she did not 
uh, load in the attorney-client communications. And there's no express waiver. Um, an important constitutional waiver, as this court knows, Miranda rights, any type of preliminary hearing, um, any type of thing like this has to be expressly waived by the client. Uh, she never did that. She never signed anything. We never waived that. We had the communications. We obviously were not opening our attorney-client communications to review. That was understood. It was also understood this would be limited to the Rust time frame. Which uh, the Detective Hancock kept her there word. Was she was very professional about how she handled this. Then Miss Morrissey, who claimed she read emails and didn't see a limitation, um, she sent those to Seth Kenny on July 12th. The emails from Hancock to Miss Morrissey were dated July 18th, six days later. So there's no way Miss Morrissey read those emails prior to sending them to Seth Kenny. She didn't take any steps to protect or to do a filter or to make sure we had a, a fair trial. Ms. Uh, Gutierrez Reed had a fair trial, not had the chief adverse witness reading her communications with me. So that is the, the basis for our motion, Your Honor, that suppression is not in and of itself. In a normal case, it would be. But here it's not because of the intertwining and the various parts of testimony Seth Kinney would give. We, we can't have a fair trial because of that, because of what's happened. I understand their argument. Ms. Morrissey. Your Honor, if it's all right, I'm going to respond on behalf of the state. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, other prosecutors, Jason, the Lewis. state must be allowed to rely upon the signed written waivers that are executed by defendants and their lawyers. In this case, we have a signed document, a consent to search authorization form that was executed on December 7th, and it's signed by both Mr. Bowles uh, and uh, Ms. Gutierrez, although Ms. Gutierrez's signature appears to be um, signed by Mr. Bowles, but regardless, both of these entities... I don't like that at all, um, but she could have given her attorney permission to sign on her behalf, but this is a kind of big deal, the consent to search the phone? Both parties have agreed to um, a Happy consent birthday, to search self. authorization, uh, and I think the consent to search authorization language is important here. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'd like to read a little bit of this. Um, the sure. consent to search authorization form says that before any search is made, you must understand what your rights are. You may refuse to consent to search and demand that a search warrant be obtained prior to any search described below. If you do consent to a search, anything of evidentiary value seized in the course of the search can and may be introduced into evidence in a court of law against you. The second page goes on to say, I authorize the deputies and detectives of the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office to seize any article of questionable nature or contraband from my vehicle slash residence slash property or any items that may be deemed to be of evidentiary value. By signing below, I am providing written consent slash permission for the above named deputy or detective or their designees to conduct the search without obtaining a warrant and to seize any evidence outlined above. I give consent slash permission freely and voluntarily without threats or promises or of any kind, either express or implied, made to someone close to me to convince me to grant consent or permission or to search the property described above. This document was emailed by uh, Corporal Hancock, and he had as much time as he wanted to review this document, to read it, to understand it, it and to game. go over it with Ms. Gutierrez. You can't tell, um, me, this, if you they can't wanted, tell me this isn't a clue game now that we've gotten to Corporal Hancock. Like, this trial is going to be difficult. Any limitations on the scope of the search? They could have been written on the form. There is a section on the form for additional notes. They didn't do that. Um, essentially, what has happened is Mr. Bowles has relied upon verbal statements to uh, Corporal Hancock, and she did follow them. Um, she and and ju I just want to be clear for the record. Um, Corporal Hancock does acknowledge. Uh, that that Mr. Bowles asked her to exclude attorney-client uh, communications from the search that she performed. Um, but that wasn't communicated to the state. When uh, Ms. Morris and however, I, Ms. Morrissey and I... However, law enforcement is an extension of the state. It's not the defense's fault if law enforcement didn't communicate that to you. It should have been written Entered down. into this case. We received a copy of the form. And as agents of the state... We are allowed to rely upon that form. If anybody who looks at this form is required to think, wow, I wonder if there are any side promises, side agreements that have been made here, I better call everybody who signed this and ask them whether some secret side deals have been made. That would invalidate the entire reason that we have but these authorization the to search forms to begin with. So 
we did not, we did, and the other thing is we didn't seize this phone. All of the cases that Mr. Bowles cited earlier, the 10th Circuit case, those are instances where the state affirmatively seized the phone. That's not what happened here. The phone was voluntarily turned over to the state and we conducted a search that was in accordance with the document that the defendant. If you're asking why lawyers don't, don't suggest that you volunteer to turn things over to law enforcement, the, the, <laughs> Here we are. They voluntarily turned it over and there was shit in there that they shouldn't have seen. And they're like, well, the defense didn't line it out on the form when they voluntarily turned over the phone. Signed. We didn't do anything that was not allowed in this waiver that she executed. With regard to some of these other arguments, Your Honor, I think the, I think the timing is, is really important for the court to understand. The disclosure of the attorney-client privilege communications happened in July. It wasn't until just about a few weeks ago that the defense started making an issue about this. They waited over six months to bring this. They knew it got turned over six months ago. Why are we dealing with this now? I don't, I get why they're flustered now, but um, I, maybe they should have brought it up. To the court's attention or to ask us to make any sort of um, accommodations concerning these text messages, even though they didn't ask us, when we found out that these uh, that this report contained attorney-client information, we immediately notified them. We immediately went to Mr. Kinney and we said, "You have got to delete that report that we provided you." He said he would. He agreed in writing to delete it. He did, however, provide a copy to his attorney. Um, I don't know, Your Honor, whether his attorney kept a copy of of the report. Uh, we asked not to be copied on any of the transmissions or communications between Mr. Kinney's lawyer and the court because we didn't want to come in contact with that document again inadvertently. Um, so based on what Mr. Bowles is saying, it sounds like the court did receive a copy of the report. Uh, but Mr. Kinney himself indicated that he deleted it as soon as we asked him to. Um, regardless, by waiting six months to ask for relief from the court now, in the form of excluding Mr. Kinney as a witness, well, they've waited too long. You know, we, the state has been working with Mr. Kinney and, and with all of the witnesses that we expect to call. And so for us to, uh, I mean, why didn't they bring it up when they discovered on it? that? Because they have waited six months to raise this issue. Um, seems unfair. I mean, it doesn't, the other thing, your honor, that I would like the court to know, like, I get that it seems unfair, but it doesn't make the problem go away. Is that the defense treated these, this report with, with, with just a, a lackadaisical approach. When we informed the defendants that this, or the defense that this report existed and was on their defense server, we asked them, would you please give us permission to delete this report from the defense server? And the reason is because at that time, there were quite a few people who had access to that, including uh, Mr. Baldwin's attorneys. And so we didn't want that report to continue to be distributed. Uh, they acknowledged, uh, it was either Mr. Bowles or Mr. Bullion acknowledged our message and then never responded further. So about a month later on August 25th, we sent a second email and we said, would you please give us permission to delete this from the defense server? And finally, at that point in time, they gave us permission to have it deleted. So, uh, you know, it, it is not the state's responsibility to protect the attorney-client communications between Mr. Bowles and Ms. Gutierrez. That's, that's Mr. Bowles' job. That's Mr. Bullion's job. We did not do anything wrong. We relied upon a completely and a validly executed authorization to search. And if this court were to rule that prosecutors can't rely on these written search forms, then they would just be of no use and value in any case going forward. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Reply, Mr. Bolts. Yes, Your Honor. It, it's stunning um, to hear them say that they don't feel like there was anything done wrong when the first email we got from Ms. Morrissey indicated the fact that the closed caption turned yes, your honor into yes, Rihanna. Is just... Rihanna with corporal, corporal, whoever in the, in the jacuzzi with the, with the weed. It's just. She does take the attorney client privilege seriously and will consider anything you uh, propose to suppress the communications. So either the government they're is, trying to suppress the communications they ask you to delete the communications but they're not going to not call the witness uh can live by their word or they cannot so their first response your honor was that we will suppress these we will agree to your proposal to get to you to suppress this is the first i've heard that all other people in baldwin's attorneys had access to that defense server 
we were told that this was a defense server for RK. I didn't realize that other people now may have seen our attorney client. So I thought <laughs> now he's these were sitting on new. a defense server with only with us having only the access to them. So there wasn't a, a dire need to get them deleted right away. This is the first I've heard just right now that Mr. Baldwin's attorneys and others had access to our attorney client information. So that, that's actually another shocking thing that I, I, I didn't realize. Stunning. The reason why this took a while is because we did not get their new theory and realized the gravity of the harm that this had caused until a month or two ago when they indicated that there was this new theory that Hannah had brought these, Miss Gutierrez-Reed, had brought the live rounds to set and had these pictures and various things. And we realized Seth Kenny had had communications with them and these attorney-client um, communications had been reviewed, was our belief by Mr. Kenny, not by Mr. Lewis and Mr. Morrissey. They've said they didn't. So that's, again, so, Your Honor, the initial thing was not a secret side deal. This was a... Uh, promise by the government by detective hancock to me which i took her at her word and she kept it she did not get into attorney client communications and they are bound by that the prosecutors are bound by that and we cited cases on that that they're a team and that's in the brady context and others they're held to that knowledge it's not just that you get a form and say oh we can't interview everybody on a secret side deal call detective hancock it's really easy and ask her you only did a thousand page report um there's eighteen thousand pages were there limitations on this search that should have been a tip-off to an experienced attorney. There's all kinds of stuff in here. We better we better run something on this. They didn't do that. Um, maybe she just texts a lot. On an attorney client on a filter, they didn't do it on IPRA on a filter, which is also required. So to say that this is all we have to safeguard them. No, the government has a duty not to invade the attorney client privilege of a defendant true, in any case. True. And that's cavalier, that's reckless. And that's that's absolutely nothing I've ever seen in 30 Shock. years. It's shocking. And it's denying Ms. Gutierrez Reed a fair trial. Your Honor, may I just make one point clear? Just 10 seconds. Yes. Yes. Um, Your Honor, we're not, I just want to be clear. We are not intending to use any of these messages at trial. No, I just, I just want the court to understand that. No, we're clear um, on all of that. We're not proposing to use. They want, they want the prosecution removed off the case and they want the entire case dismissed because this witness is tainted. Like, we're clear that you're not trying to use them. Like, that's that's clear. Anything um, from this report between in that shot, Mr. Bowles sir, and Ms. Gutierrez at all. Can we just Thank you. The court makes the following ruling. I'm First captivated. of all, that consent to search is what controls. These text messages of defense counsel. The court has uh, her eye on you to tell you that you are the one who fucked up. The consent to search is what controls, and you know what you didn't say in the consent to search? These are the names of the lawyers. This all needs to be pulled out because we believe there's attorney-client privilege information in here. This is not going to go well for the defense. About um, Talk to Hannah. She just wants to make sure her private like her private photos are not are not given away and um yeah i'll keep it to the rust rust um time frame very casual i'm not sure when now i've heard that the state agrees that um mr bowles did say i need the attorney client also and she said okay that could have been before after it doesn't matter to the court because what's controlling is that consent to search authorization you have absolute opportunity that is what you use oh, she sent it to you you were able to read it ahead of time you're saying that that ms gutierrez didn't didn't wave anything she sure did her signature's on it and it, to reiterate if you consent to a search anything of evidentiary value seized in the course of search can and may be introduced into evidence i give consent permission freely and voluntarily without threats promises of any kind either express or implied made made to me or someone close you're telling them that, that that she promised you she gave her word this it's is there. this is saying no this would have been your opportunity to have put it in. All, uh, this this IPRA is, you know, I'm not I'm not going to get, uh, you know, uh, an IPRA trial in here. The inspection of public records says every person has a right to inspect public records of this state. Ex the IPRA request she's talking about is Seth Kinney asking and making a public records request for this cell phone dump and it getting turned over to him. That's what they're talking about with the IPRA request and whether that was appropriate or not. Yep, certain types of information, including attorney client privilege information. In this manner, the statute gives the public the right to access information except where the right doesn't exist. However, critically in the IPRA, IPRA statute, it doesn't forbid the state to disclose information that the public does not have the right to access. 
It merely protects the state from being compelled to do it. IPRA acts yeah, as a accidents. shield from compelled disclosure. It's accidents not a sword to attack the government when it decides to disclose in spite of IPRA's protections. The timeline is you put no restriction on it and um, and, and, and it, it falls under IPRA. You're saying they had a duty to do attorney client? That was on you. How, how are they going to know what's a term, attorney client, what's waived? Just because you have text message, they're going to say, oh, there was no there was no waiver. They have to refer to the consent form. Third, I did do the in-camera review. And to the defense, that was on you. And she did a full in-camera review of the text messages. So she knows all of what's in there. I find that the communications are not materially prejudicial to the defendant or defendant's trial, st st trial strategy. I don't know what happened to the volume, but at least we still have the closed captioning. Oh, no, we don't. Your Honor. How You're... long have I been on mute? <laughs> Excuse me, Judge Rihanna, your mic, your, your, your mic. How long have I been on mute? She looks like she's looking at her JA. Um, only for just a moment, Your Honor. About 30 seconds. Okay, so what I'm saying is, third, I did conduct the in-camera review, okay? And it exactly talked about public were. relations with respect to the media. There, that's, that's, that's what was in there. It was media information. Um, what was said in the media? So the attorney and the client are talking about the media, talking about the case. You know, how to respond to this, things like that. The state's decision to share the 18th, thousand page report with a state's witness before reviewing this contents questionable as to you know why we didn't why we why we didn't do that but you know when she says that she re respects the attorney-client privilege that doesn't mean that she 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 violated any duty the consent to search authorization should have been negotiated and drafted to exclude the attorney-client privilege i'm denying the motion mr lewis prepare that order judge i i would ask the court if this court would include interlock appeal language in that no, you're, you're allowed to appeal anything, but not, not sir. You're asking for an interlocutory appeal on this issue. Trial starts in like tick tock, like a week before trial. And I'm just asking on the interlocutory appeal oh, language, uh -huh. that this court include that in the order. No. Okay. <laughs> then we have to consider a writ and I just want to alert the court. To yeah. That. Then you have All to right. consider a writ. Okay. All right. Now we're going to move over to, um, I mean, that writ needs to be taken out. Ms. Morrissey like, talked about um, the motion in limine. I mean, the prior bad acts notice. There's been no motion in limine for me. For Trial starts next week. Trial starts next Wednesday. We're going to have to take out a writ. He says it to the judge like it's a threat. We're going to have to take out a writ. And the court's like, you do you. Me to consider. So I'm not, so I'm, there's nothing before me today on the prior bad acts. Now we're going to move over to, and I'm going to address these now because I, I don't, I do not have blocks of time in my schedule before the jury selection so we've got a um two late witnesses and we've got a voir dire request let me just address the voir dire request you're entitled to voir dire i, I don't see why that would be a problem so Thank you, okay um do you oppose that mr bowles or do you recognize oh, yeah. it no i think that's totally appropriate to uh, yeah, okay I, I don't oppose to, that to voir dire the they're talking about the attorneys having the opportunity to voir dire the jurors meaning not just the judge asked questions but the attorneys also ask questions um for the chat asking what's a writ he a writ would be an appeal while the case is ongoing on this ruling so he would try to take out a writ pause this case from going forward and get the appellate court to take up the issue of the attorney client privilege and the motion to dismiss experts outside the presence of the jury yes absolutely okay, okay. Yes. all right now let's go to these uh this late disclosure of an expert and um of a pack witness Mr. Um, Bowles, let me hear from you why this is happening. Yes, Your Honor. So Lenny Callis. Is Late disclosure of an expert and a lay witness. So the court's like, um, we had deadlines. Why do you get to call this witness and why is this happening? So the defense has to now d defend themselves on on what the fuck happened. Is a, a female armor uh, on the East Coast who contacted us very recently uh, within the last 10 days. That's not, um, I, we didn't know okay. anything about her. Um, she reached out to me by email and said she felt like she had very material information, including with regard to union um, and uh, requirements of union, which Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was not. Um, her experience as an armor, 
and expert testimony generally related to that. We had to call her and vet her as to what she would say, get her CV, and then we uh, sent that to the state. Now, this was not something we, we didn't know about her till within the last 10 days. Well, that's your job, though. So that's why this came out late, Your Honor. We immediately, by email, said she would do a pretrial interview any day on an hour's notice. She's indicated she, she's available any day, including the weekend. She will do a pretrial interview. Um, alternatively, I mean, if, if and no one wants to continue the trial, but we would agree to that as a remedy. Um, in, instead of exclusion of a witness who just came to us. And the other thing that's been hard, Your Honor, we don't have the resources of the state. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed doesn't have a special appropriation. We've had to find experts who have agreed. Your Honor, the state has more money. Yes. To assist without compensation. And that's been another very, very difficult thing in the defense of Ms. Yeah, Gutierrez-Reed. that is hard. And she came forward in, in the last 10 days. That's what happened. That is Who hard. is she going to testify to? She's going to testify that as a union... Uh, Armor, you are trained in certain requirements. You are also certified in certain things. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was not uh, union. She had applied to the union, but she was not yet union. And so she cannot be held um, to the standard of some of the things that the prosecution is mentioning because she's not union. Um, she's also going to testify with regard to the live, uh, or to placing the rounds in the firearm that on a very busy movie set, that this is a mistake that could be made, especially because dummies uh, and live rounds, they look like each other. They can be confused. And when you're rushed and you're being yelled into your ear to get something done, this is a mistake that can happen. Um, she's also going to testify to, in general, you should not have two roles as an armor on a gun-heavy set, uh, which uh, the state's expert was going to testify to, too. Carpenter said the same thing. She was a props assistant and an armor. So she's going to reiterate that. This was. It's like they're trying to argue that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was not qualified to do her job in any way. So it's not her fault because she was just not qualified. Okay. A situation where Ms. Gutierrez-Reed did not have the adequate resources, was required to do two jobs, and, and mistakes can happen. That's essentially what she would testify to. Response on, the, on that one, not the, not the fact witness, this one. Uh, Your Honor, the, the defense has had years to get a professional armor to be their expert. True. They have had years to do it. In fact, we have a. Pro I bet they. I bet the union has like a list of union armorers, as well. Professional armorer who who has been on the witness list since day one. The defense has always understood that what they needed to do was try to get their own expert. It's absolutely not fair for them to spring an expert on us a week before trial when they've been on notice that they needed to do this the entire time. And look, this I, isn't I, a I'm, surprise. I'm not unsympathetic to the fact that Ms. Gutierrez has limited resources, but I also understand that if you have limited resources, I mean, that is the case of a lot of criminal defendants. That's not a surprise. You go to the public defender and they have the resources to hire all of those experts. So the fact that she hired lawyers who, who, who are without resources to do is this not, just means that they should have told her you need to go to the public defender's office right. because we don't have those resources. There, there is, this is, this is, this is crazy that, that for two years, I don't know if this is they, crazy, they act like we didn't know this lady existed. She just called us. They knew that, that having a professional armor as an expert witness was something they probably should have done. And they just didn't do it for years and now here we are a week before trial in order for any of this to work she has to be interviewed her interview has to be transcribed your honor deadlines matter they missed the cutoff we have to sit with our expert and go through it there's all kinds of preparation that has to take place I mean, I don't and we simply don't have the time to do it we're getting ready to do a trial where we're calling like 30 witnesses we can't carve out the next week to to try to solve the mistake and the problem that mr bowles and mr bullion made when they didn't go look for an expert for years <laughs> mr. It, it's absolutely outrageous we would bowls of bullion bowls of bullion bowls of bullion bowls of bullion uh, that's on you guys. Uh, you should have done this sooner. Absolutely. Ask the court to, like, to this exclude this person. This person needed to be there. I mean, at least six months ago. I, I can't, I couldn't even believe it when we got, when we She's got a like, supplemental witness list. Shocking, and listen, I also want you to know, judge, shocking. these guys didn't reach out to us shocking. and say, Hey, 
we just found out about this lady. You know, we let, let, let's talk about this. How, how do we find out? She is always in all caps. It, it's a little exhausting. That this is happening. They just sent us a copy of a supplemental witness list. They didn't take any, they never have come to us and said, hey, we'd like to move to continue the trial. If they want to move to continue the trial, they can file an opposed motion to continue and the court can decide how to handle it. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Bowles. Judge, that's actually not. <laughs> Shit. Your Honor, that's actually not a bad idea. Let's continue it. No. Not true. We emailed the state and let them know about this new witness that had contacted us. That's absolutely 100% not true. Ms. Morrissey knows that. We actually did look for experts, and that's what I tried to convey to the court, that we did look for experts. We were not able to find that type of expert. We found others uh, until Lenny Callis contacted us. And that's how we, and within the last 10 days, we got her information. Now, we, we told them that. We emailed them about Ms. Callis, and we emailed her CV, and we said, we'll have a PTI anytime. Uh, this is no surprise what she's going to testify to because their armor has virtually the same testimony, um, except for the uh, union part. That's the only part that's okay. different. Uh, Mr. Carpenter uh, essentially says the same the same thing that I've seen. So, Judge, we did. We were diligent. We did try to find experts throughout this. We just couldn't, and she came to we just couldn't find an expert that wanted to touch this case with a 10 fucking foot pole. I imagine the armorer community is quite small. Us at the very end, that's what happened. That's you know who else is an armorer? You know who else is an armorer? Her dad. I, I would just think that the defense attorneys could call Hannah Gutierrez Reed's father, who is a well respected armorer, and be like, Do you know some armorers that, that we could uh that we could chat with? I feel like they had uh they had that that resource within grasp. That's the facts. Let me respond. When you're telling me that she that you emailed them, you emailed them pretty much that day, if I'm not mistaken. What the, where's that? The email is, I mean, that's that's a, that's misleading to say that they had time because the email was right then and there when you did your disclosure of witnesses. You just attached it to your disclosure to let me know that you had reached out to them. Not sufficient time. I'm denying the motion on this basis. Number one, it's late. It's too late. I'm not going to continue the the trial. Denied. Do not ask me. No one asked me. For motion, I'm telling you right now, I'm not continuing the trial. Do, do not even step to me with continuance. You don't get to bring in your witness because you didn't do your due diligence. It is too late. Secondly, um, this thing about the only difference that she's going to do is about a, is about the union duties. Well, fine. Fine. They Ask can stipulate that she's not union. You know, you cross. can cross a cross examine about what, you know, do you know what union does? This Ask is and the cross. fact that she reached out to you. Is, is is tells me that that this is not prejudicial to you you didn't go seek her out you didn't think that, that she reached out to you and the other thing is is it is unfair to the state exactly yeah. what ms morrissey said they'd have to do this they'd have to do that and there may be a continuance there may have been a continuance because they would have needed more time but they're not going to need more time because i'm, I'm denying not letting it i'm not expert. allowing this expert all right next up is the fact witness what the what's this um your honor with regard to the fact witness uh, the, the state amended their witness list, I want to say about a month ago, and they and we didn't make a big stink over it, even though it was pretty close to trial. Uh, they I mean, said you said the state amended. You said the state amended. I'm sorry. I apologize, Your Honor. The, the, the defense amended uh, their witness list, and they added uh, a fact witness, and they indicated that they would schedule a pretrial interview with this witness. And I followed up with them a couple of times saying, you know, we need to get this interview done because we're coming up on trial. They have never provided an interview with this witness. Well, then, His name is Zach Sneesby. He was a member of the crew. They knew. This case is going to do me. I'm sorry, Mr. Sneesby. It's just this game is this this case is already a game of clue, and we've got bullion and bowls and bowls of bullion and Mr. Sneesby. I I'm not going to survive about this person the entire time he's on the call sheet everybody knew about sneezeby everybody knew everybody who was on the crew so they haven't provided him with a with, uh, they haven't provided us with a pre-trial interview and we're asking that he be excluded i don't know why they haven't been able to set him for an interview but it's too late now <laughs> mr bolt judge and once again miss morris he's known about him the whole time the state interviewed him early on but but here's the thing he's not on their witness list though my guy she just said we we haven't been able to reach him we've reached out multiple yeah when you're the defense, sometimes people don't want to talk to you. It happens to prosecutors too. Mr. Sneezeby is like, leave me the fuck out of this. Times and he hasn't gotten back to us. So we agree. 
Um, if he's not going to submit to a pretrial interview, then he can't be a witness. Um, but the, the idea that they didn't know, they've known about him the whole time too. He was interviewed by the state. He's not on their the witness officers. list is what I'm getting from all of this. All right. That takes care of that one. Okay. Goodbye, so, um, I need an order from the state on the, um, expert late disclosure. Goodbye, expert. Kyle. Um, have I missed anything? The, I don't believe so, your honor. Oh God. Okay. And judge, we intend to also submit a, an offer of proof on a detail to what she would testify to. Uh, and I want to make who? that part of the record. That who would talk about? Oh. Are you going to do it now? I can't do it now. I need to get it from her, and I'll submit it in writing. Who the expert? All right. Well, we'll note that you can't. You don't know what she's. You put her down, and you don't know what she's going to testify to. <laughs> no, Judge. I told you the outlines of it, but I want to make sure I'm clear in the record. Uh, so I do know the outlines, and he, I did indicate that to the court. He walked right into that. The judge is like, so I'll just put it down that uh, you intend to call her and have no idea what she's going to testify to. <laughs> The judges, the judges sass is just like the, the speed, the speed that, 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 that sass whipped back around on this defense. Oh, we're not going to get to see as much of this judge sass. I don't think during trial, but this is going to be fantastic. But I want to have a clear record. Okay. Well, the clear record for me is that you only outlined, but that does, so you, so if you're going to put, put all these, these, this information in after the fact, on my ruling, which is related to what you've given the court, that's fine. All right, thank you. We're in recess. Done and done. All right, there we go. That is, let's try to summarize that real quick, shall we, law nerds? Let's, uh, let's do that together. So this afternoon, we, uh, we were back in New Mexico for the last motions hearing before the Hannah Gutierrez Reed trial for the fatal shooting on the set of the Rust movie of the cinematographer Helena Hutchins. This is scheduled to start jury selection on February 21st, 2024. It's my understanding that there will be cameras in the courtroom, and if there are cameras in the courtroom, there's going to be commentary on this trial. It's going to be very, very interesting to see how all of the evidence plays out in this case. The court denied a prosecution motion to exclude a scathing OSHA report. That's going to come in by way of the defense experts. The defense motion to exclude some evidence that Hannah Gutierrez Reed had given her friend a bag of supposed cocaine to hold on to um, is, is going to be allowed to come in. It's not going to be severed out of the case. There will be some text messages that indicated that Hannah Gutierrez Reed had been um, using drugs and drinking in the evenings while on set. The defense then brought motions to, or the prosecution brought in motions to exclude late uh, turned over witnesses and the court was not having any of it. So we've started to see kind of the way this evidence is shaping up. The defense is saying, you know, we absolutely have evidence that somebody brought these bullets onto set. The prosecution is saying we absolutely have evidence that Hannah Gutierrez Reed brought these live rounds onto set. It's going to be an interesting trial. And then we got to the motion, the motion to dismiss over these text messages that were taken out of a cell phone extraction from the defendant that included text messages between defendant uh, Gutierrez and the um, defense attorneys. The court found that the defense attorneys, and this is what she put on the record, the defense attorneys should have limited the scope of the search when they consented to the search of the phone. They didn't do that. All of it got extracted from the phone. It all got turned over to the prosecution. And then Seth Kinney made a public records request to examine those and the prosecution turned it over. When the prosecution discovered that there were attorney-client communications in there, they asked Seth Kenny to delete it. The defense is big mad about it. It's not going to, excuse me, it's not going to be relevant, um, the conversations between the defense attorney and the defendant, but it might open the door if this defendant testifies, and I, I, I guess we'll see if she will or if she won't, but if this defendant testifies, could there be an off chance that that comes up? I don't know. Do I think they've kind of waived some of that? Yes, uh, but I don't think the prosecution, that's dangerous ground to tread into in a very difficult case. This is a difficult case uh, for the prosecution to prove. Jurors do not like these types of negligent homicide cases because it often feels like a tragic accident that um, shouldn't result in murder charges. However, I think 
that most people looking at this case can look at this case and go, okay, but something went terribly wrong that somebody's getting shot on a movie set. This never should have happened. And somebody was obviously negligent. Like the, the thing speaks for itself. You don't end up with a cinematographer that's fatally shot and killed if someone on this set isn't negligent. So they're going to have to tie together how Hannah Gutierrez Reed was criminally negligent leading to this. And this set, by all accounts, was a shit show. But that doesn't mean that Hannah Gutierrez Reed wasn't one of the parties that contributed to the death of Helena Hutchins. This is going to be an interesting trial. I'm going to cover every day of it that I can. I have a little bit of trial uh, travel in there, depending on how long jury selection takes and stuff. But we will absolutely be covering this trial if there are cameras in that courtroom. I believe that there will be. Things can change. The defense is going to take a writ and try to say that this ruling is uh, is untenable. I don't think that's going to stall the trial from going forward, and it'll all come up on appeal if she's convicted. So with all of that, I'm going to answer just a few questions, and then I am going to bounce because I've got uh, I've got to go you know, do Valentine's Day things. The Valentine's Day things today are making sure everyone in my house is uh, taking Tylenol at the appropriate time because now everyone is sick. I am still sick, and everyone else is sick. When my kid came home yesterday with a fever, I was like, fuck. And then I looked at Dr. B and I was like, you're, you're looking like you don't feel so good. And he's like, yeah, I don't feel so good. I'm like, fuck. So, um, everybody it's going down at the Baker house. Happy Valentine's day. Everybody. Here's some, here's some soup and, and Tylenol. It's, it's just what it is. Let's get to some questions real quick. Just because asked, if someone disposes of an unrelated weapon, does that mean that it can still be connected to a specific crime? I'm so confused. So the argument, the argument over whether or not the uh, disposal of the supposed cocaine was tampering with evidence related to the negligent homicide was an argument that even though they happen later in the day, they might not have the one might not be connected to the other. Um, the the analogies got a little difficult, but it generally has to be related to the crime that you're dealing with. So that is a big part of it. Missy said a lot of legalese today, and I appreciate you. Lots of legalese today. Um, so are we saying that physical cocaine found outside of the set was also ingested by her the same day? How much coke was it? No idea. And it was from later that night, like after she, after Hannah Gutierrez Reed got back from the interview with police, gave it to someone else to hold. So do we know how much? No, I don't think it was ever tested. Like, how are they going to prove it's cocaine? There's a witness that was like, uh, she gave me coke. Like, okay. this is going to be wild. Um, Shiraz said, why don't lawyers require their clients to use an app if they want to contact them? It would isolate these uh, communications. I don't know. I don't. I don't text with uh I don't I don't have to text with peeps. I don't know what civil attorneys do. At, it seems like it could be so easy. Um Cat Mom said ordered my I have questions hoodie for my first cancer treatment. I hope it is a good cancer treatment. I hope that it keeps you it keeps you uh feeling like you're being hugged by the law nerds when you go in for treatment and that everything goes well. Motion for a clue themed accessories for this trial. We might I mean it's it's somebody with the marijuana in the jacuzzi is what it is right now. Um, Mary Ellen said, I want Runkle's opinion. I'm sure we will get it. I know he's been active in the chat, but I'm sure we will hear from Runkle um, soon. Uh, Sam said, get, Sam gifted five memberships. Thank you, Sam, for the gifted memberships. Victoria said, question, the defendant doesn't give the weapon to Alec. Does that affect her case? No, because Hannah Gutierrez Reed is in charge of loading the weapon. So live rounds got into the weapon. She's the one who loaded the weapon. So it was known that it was going to then get handed to Alec Baldwin. And it's foreseeable that if you put a loaded bullet in a weapon that somebody could get shot with that bullet. So that's the argument there. I'm going to do a podcast on this next week, if that would be helpful and break down the charges, what has to be proven and, and kind of set the stage for the trial. I think that might be helpful as this trial gets underway next week. Niffer, thank you for the gifted memberships, y'all. Thank you for the Valentine's Day gifts to all the all the other law nerds. I love it. Um, Jake said, so glad to be a part of this community. 
potato fanatic. Oh, potato sounds so good. Um, I love this community. Hey, look at my fancy new yellow gavel. Rhapsody in blue. It looks great. I saw it in the chat. Um, I'm I'm advocating for them to show up on StreamYard. StreamYard makes it so easy to stream, and I absolutely love partnering with StreamYard and being a StreamYard partner. I'm advocating to get those uh, pulled up. Lana said, please can Reed use ineffective assistance of counsel, uh, not unless she is convicted and then wants to use that to appeal. But she chose these counsel, like these are her hired attorneys. Ellen said, it's always a delight, good way, uh, good way to, and my birthday. Happy birthday. I know there were a couple birthdays in the stream. So happy birthday to all of you celebrating. Shiraz, thank you for the gifted memberships. We need clue bingo. We might, we might. Um, Bernie said, just thank you. You're welcome. Happy to be here. EDB stream and NSF stream equals amazing day. Wonderful. I adore this judge. This judge is not having uh, any of it. And I saw a lot of you making the comparison to this judge looking like Paula Abdul. And even though when the defense attorney said your honor and it read as Rihanna in the chat, it might end up being, um, it might end up being Judge Abdul. It might. Uh, thank you for the super chat, J. Michael. Agreed. Um, happy Valentine's Day, Lawners. Thank you, Bijou Girl. I appreciate that. Um, what Alika said. Okay, hear me out. We start trial cards, so places people evidence receipts on Pokemon clue type cards, collectible for different trials. Big ass, but I'd pay big bucks. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that. We might have something similar in the works that we're getting ready to put up for sale that is very much along the line of Pokemon cards. It, we we might have something similar and we are working on collectibles for each trial. We're also, there's a few other things in the works, but you're, you're thinking the same, you're thinking the same direction. So uh, members and those of you in the app will have first access to those because they are going to be uh, extremely limited. So if you are a member, if you are in the app, you will have first look. That's the first thing I'm going to do tomorrow. Look, the first look I'm going to be doing tomorrow is trying to get myself a Stanley Chroma mug. Emily, what are you going to be like running over people in a store? No, no, no. But I will actively and quickly be online tomorrow morning. Oh, I need to go check if I got Dave Matthews band tickets. I need to do that when I get done. Um, the Kelly said OSHA an overall report. It's not an individualized per person. Correct. It's not individualized per person, but it's going to come up. It is going to absolutely come up um, through the experts. Alpha, Beta, Omega said, my mom got me hooked on your channel and with you explaining the legal things have helped understand a lot of things about court. Hope you feel better. Thank you, Alpha, Beta, Omega. I need to feel better. I am very frustrated still being sick. It's annoying. Um, Suzanne Zumpino, Emily, I am a nurse and thanks to you mentioning about nursing in the legal field, I got a job as a legal nurse analyst. Congratulations and thank you for circling back and keeping us updated. Thank you and congratulations. That's absolutely incredible. Lawyers need all of the help. So, um, ABQ Cat said, Emily, please address if alternative New Mexico manslaughter charges would mean added negligent firearm penalty um, added if the in an unlawful manner alternative is found. We, we will talk about potential alternative charges that are brought, but the jury's not going to have those to consider if they're not already brought. So that is where we're at with that. But it will, I talked about the charges the first time I did a podcast on this and I will talk about it again, but thank you, ABQ cat for the, for the detailed request. I will keep it in mind. Uh, Enchanted Wolf said, I only live about 50 miles away from the courthouse. I'll try to go to this trial um, and back down or reporting. I think we will, let me know if you do. Um, I'm hoping that we will have streams of it. Um, Bafra said on Friday, I was granted custody of my niece, 10 years old. I'm 30 with no kids. All of my years of watching you help me understand the legal worlds or the legal words. Thank you so much. Um, Bafra, what a incredible, incredible act of love for your niece. That is a tremendously uh, large undertaking, I am sure. It is a fun age, and I'm sure your niece is very thankful to be with you. So I'm glad that the the just the legal jargon can help. Um, 
look, if I can help anyone feel more comfortable when engaging with our court system and not feel so overwhelmed by it, the court, the thing that's so frustrating and difficult with the court system is it's truly set up to try to right wrongs and try to help. And, and it doesn't always do that in a good way. It doesn't always do that in an easy way. Um, it o often gets overrun with money and can be deeply, deeply intimidating for the people that are trying to help. If I can help anyone feel more comfortable engaging with the court system that is truly here to work with you, um, then I've absolutely done my job and done the thing that I consider to be the most helpful. I became a lawyer because I wanted to help. And I hope that making the legal system more accessible, demystifying it and not making it feel um, so scary and overwhelming can help people engage with this in their everyday life. And that is absolutely, that woodpecker is very distracting, um, is, is really what I love to do here. And there are so many incredible lawyers breaking down all different areas of law on this platform that I hope that law becomes uh, easier to engage with. It's meant to be here for us, not to exclude and intimidate and be inaccessible, right? So that's that's the goal of breaking down cases like this. And, you know, and to have some fun, honestly. Lawyers are wild, courts wild, judges are snappy, everyone's hungry, it's funny. Un unhinged shit, unhinged shit happens. I am going to get distracted by that woodpecker constantly. I love my new bird feeder. Fred and George are in heaven, but I have ADHD. And I absolutely have reached the age of my life where I I love bird watching. I really, I really do. There are so many different songbirds. I mean, where where I lived in Southern California, we had two like really mean crows and um and that was about it and they scared everybody else off so that's what it was anyway i love this community you guys have a wonderful valentine's day i do not feel great i am going to wrap i've got to go pick up my kiddo um i appreciate you thank you for hanging with me for this afternoon stream um you guys it just you warm my heart i appreciate you i'm so so grateful that this is what I get to do. And I get to do the thing I love the most in the world because you love it too. So have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Thank you for being here. Take care of yourselves and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media and don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a law nerd. Bye.